They went to provide a vital resource. But what Tennessee soldiers did in a foreign land launched a U.S. Army criminal investigation into how Tennesseans ignored warnings about human trafficking and prostitution in the Horn of Africa and in the process placed sensitive classified materials in jeopardy. There need to be some consequences. The Channel 4 I team not only obtained the military investigation, but also photographs and other evidence into what members of the 775th Engineering Detachment did in both Djibouti, Africa, and in just across the border in Dire Dawa, Ethiopia. Criminal actions the public never knew about until now. The unit was sent to help dig water wells in and around Camp Lemonier in Djibouti and Dire Dawa. The military investigation shows the soldiers were given training by a captain in early July about, quote, that there was an issue with human trafficking in the area, how women end up stranded in Dire Dawa while trying to get to the Middle East. I told them not to engage in using prostitutes and that part of the mission is a positive projection of America. Moses Achonu is a native African and teaches African history at Vanderbilt. The poverty uh, makes people desperate in that region, and it is not uncommon sometimes to see underage girls, and uh, sometimes even boys, try to eke out a living by you know, selling themselves. But both before and after that training, the military investigation found probable cause that nine of the 19 members of the unit had sex with prostitutes either at an off-base residence in Djibouti or committed sexual acts in exchange for money at the Samrat Hotel in Dire Dawa. The agent's investigation shows a lieutenant saying there were ringleaders who told the soldiers what to say to try to stay out of trouble, how many of the men bragged about the sex, and how a medic handed out condoms. We were in the theater when it happened. He was holding an axe and a gun. Then I heard my daughter screaming. They'd gone in to escape from the world for a while. They never expected to have to escape themselves. I just told them, run, run. And the source of all that fear? A thin man wearing glasses who, before the afternoon showing of Mad Max, casually walked into the nearby Dollar General. No one paid any attention to how Vincente Montano rummaged through his bag, a bag investigators would later discover carried weapons, pepper spray, and enough strange objects for police to believe a bomb was inside. Vincente Montano's life was already in pieces, long before he was shot to death 22 times by Metro Police. Went into my room one day and cut up all my pictures. Went around the house, cut up all the pictures and the picture frames. He just said that they told him to, that they were looking at him, that they were talking to him, that, you know, he had to cut him up. Earlier today, a man armed with a gun. As the country watched the latest movie theater attack unfold on live television last August, Montano's family had no idea. You'll find out why in just a moment. But after a reporter called, Montano's sister and mother turned on the television. Police say 29-year-old Vincente Montano. To see a face they immediately recognized, but hadn't seen in years. It was like a kick to the stomach, honestly. Um, you think about the families that had to go through that. You think about your brother. Hearing the gunshots on television was probably the hardest thing that me and my family had to hear and deal with. They knew then that the time to save Vincente had run out. I've been looking for him because of his illness, mm -hmm. because he's 29, mm -hmm. because those people with that illness don't make it past mm -hmm. 30. And knowing for more than half of those 29 years, Vincente, or Vince as his family called him, was a real success story. A straight A student, president of the National Art Honor Society at his school in Illinois, who grew into a happy, creative teenager. Then, at 17 years old, Vince began to show the first signs of the schizophrenia that would haunt him for the rest of his days. 
live with breaking news. Human remains were found this morning in a burned car. Now a second body has been discovered in Pembroke, Kentucky. News of the murders didn't just shatter the calmness of Pembroke. It also destroyed the future for the only identified person of interest whose home was raided by a SWAT team. What can I go back to? You know, I'm ruined. Major Christian Kit Martin knows what you've heard. How across the street, his neighbor Calvin Phillips was found shot to death in his home. How the bodies of Calvin's wife Pam and neighbor Ed Dancero were discovered in Pam's burned out car. How the very next day, a SWAT team burst into Martin's home. Military investigators seized him and kept him in custody for days. I get taken down like a terrorist. He also knows what the Channel 4 I team first exposed last night. How despite a family court ruling that it didn't happen, his ex-wife Joan says he beat her. How she and Calvin Phillips found a military computer and secret disks in the home and turned it over to the FBI. How it all led to military charges. And how Cal Phillips was sent to testify in the court-martial but was murdered two weeks before it was scheduled to begin. Can you see why people would say, they gotta look at this guy, he's suspicious? Yeah, until you realize the background that I'm trying to tell you here, you know, that he was my star witness. You heard him right. Martin says Cal Phillips was to be his star witness in the court martial. My star witness is now gone. But how can that be? After all, Joan Harmon says Cal knew about her allegations of abuse. He stands to serve a lot of time in prison for abusing us, and these were people that were potential adult witnesses to his crimes. And it was Cal Phillips who admitted in recorded conversations with Martin's own private investigators that he took the military computer and disks. What'd you do with it? I turned it into the FBI. But Martin says you have to listen to the recordings and what Phillips said when he was asked about Joan's claims of abuse. Hearing this, she never told you that he's molesting the kids? No, I don't ever remember he's that. He's raped me? No. He sodomized me? No. He beats me? No. And just went down the whole line and just refuted everything. And it was like them golden. But Martin knows he's under criminal investigators' microscope as well. December 14th, Zach and Ithaca Jones are here to clean an apartment. Hi, I'm great. How are you? Okay. What they didn't know is that the Channel 4i team outfitted that apartment with our hidden cameras. And what we captured shows not a thorough cleaning, but a thorough casing. Finding jewelry in drawers, in a box, and wait till you see what he does in the closet. And we set up these cameras because of what happened to Gloria West, Ali Sands, and Danelle Walker. And I almost feel like I paid someone to come in here and steal my stuff. You know? These three women all found Zach Jones's cleaning company, IGB Residential Cleaning Services, through an online coupon on Living Social. They did it to save money, but say it ended up costing them plenty. All of my gold and fine jewelry was taken. It's a devastating thing. You know, the, the items that I lost were things that I could never replace. They went through everything. Ali Sands also hired IGB to clean her house. She too discovered all her jewelry, including a diamond necklace, missing. Police later told her that Zach Jones pawned a diamond the day after he cleaned her house. Well, felt betrayed. I felt violated. All three women reported the thefts to police and learned it was nearly impossible to prove that Jones or his cleaning service had stolen anything. So they turned to the Channel 4i team. We started digging and found out the man who they had hired to clean was a convicted thief out of Georgia. That's when we went to work, setting up cameras in several places, including this air vent, and hired IGB to come clean. The victims had all told us the cleaning crew didn't touch their costume jewelry, just took the good stuff. These are not real pearls, and he knew it. So we set out costume jewelry throughout the bedroom, wanting to see if he would scope out our rings and necklaces. But what happened next was something we never anticipated. 
When we returned to pay IGB, they were gone. And so were our hidden cameras. And they stole our hidden cameras. We called the police, filed a theft report. But remember, not all our hidden cameras were taken. And Zach Jones probably wishes he'd found this one. Jones walks into the bedroom and at some point goes directly to where we hid the camera in the vent. Check out how closely he examines that vent. Then he heads to the dresser, wastes no time. First, he goes for the ring in the drawer and doesn't just pick it up, he examines it closely. Then he moves to the jewelry box, taking out the ring in a bag. It's all fake, so he moves on. He hits the closet. He hasn't even cleaned a thing in the room yet. And what he did next, well, you just gotta watch. <sighs> After blowing his nose in a scarf, he goes right for our jewelry bag we stashed away. Listen, you can hear him open it and go through it. It's all costume jewelry and none of it was taken. But look at this. If you slow down the video, see what's in his left hand? Yeah, that's the viewfinder from one of our cameras. Chow down. Kenneth Munson was feeding his cows. That's when I seen the police officers pull in. Benjamin Nichols was putting in antifreeze in his truck. I said, well, what's going on? He said, there's a couple warrants out for your arrest out of Murfreesboro. Both were taken into custody. After all, there were affidavits with their names on it. Nichols was wanted out of Murfreesboro, Munson out of Wilson County, and Lewisburg. But there was only one problem. I'm like, Wilson County? I've never been to Wilson County. I don't even know where that's at. I was like, dude, y'all have their own guy. A Channel 4 I-Team investigation shows how these men believe sloppy police work resulted in their wrongful arrests and nights spent in jail simply because they share the same name with a suspect. And in Nichols' case, the police agree. Preliminarily, we believe that the officer messed up here. Kenneth Munson went from being on his farm to jail in two different counties when a warrant was issued for a Kenneth Munson suspected of stealing two trucks. Beyond just the name, he fit the description, early 50s, 6'1", about 180 pounds. Handcuffed me, shackled me, and walked me out into the courtroom in front of everybody like I you know, was this big criminal. After all, four of the victims identified Munson in a lineup. But take a look at this. Court records show two of the victims said the Kenneth Munson who stole their truck was from Indianapolis. Wilson County deputies started looking at that suspect. Here he is. And here's the Kenneth Munson who was ultimately arrested and charged. There are physical similarities. And while the Indianapolis Kenneth Munson hasn't been charged, the victim said the Kenneth Munson who stole their truck had a neck tattoo and earrings. There's the Indianapolis's Kenneth Munson's neck tattoo, and you can see the Shelbyville Kenneth Munson has no neck tattoo and no earrings. It's January 6th, and Sergeant First Class Christian Castillo is preparing to celebrate. After all, his Facebook page shows he's proud to be a recruiting manager with the Tennessee National Guard. So it's no surprise he joined this celebration of who brought in the most new recruits. But it's what the Channel 4 I-Team uncovered that has some of his own fellow recruiters saying the upper ranks of the National Guard shouldn't have allowed him to even be in this position. He should have got fired. General, that is Major General Terry Haston. This is a reporter who's requested an interview with him for months. General, hey, this is Jeremy Finley with Channel 4. You know, I've tried, sir, I've tried to schedule a few interviews with you. You can see he was more interested in leaving than answering questions. General, will you please, please speak with me? Jason Huber is an associate professor with the Charlotte School of Law, whose civil rights clinic has led a nationwide push to do away with what's called release dismissal agreements, where prosecutors will drop criminal charges against a person if that person agrees to drop their civil rights lawsuit. But a spokesman did send an email indicating the law reads they don't have to tell us what action they took. Quote, appropriate disciplinary measures pursuant to the severity of the infraction were taken by the command according to regulations and command policy. Records of such actions are protected by the Privacy Act of 1974. 